That's awesome, awesome singing so far. You guys have done a great job. And uh, it hasn't been a great church service so far, guys. Yeah. It has indeed right there, guys. You know, uh, let's get into it, guys. The time of my lesson today is simply the characteristics of a mother. You know, uh, first and foremost, you know, I want to say happy Mother's Day to the mothers here in the church right there. You know, uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, mainly those who are part of the church. You know, uh, Mama Betty, you know, we got Mama Georgia, Lillian right there, and Comfort. You guys look amazing. You guys look beautiful. You guys are amazing mothers, and we are grateful for you today. You want to give it up for them, guys? You don't love your mothers? Okay. You don't love your mothers right there. You know, uh, moms are amazing. You know, they are also amazing moms. You know, how amazing are they? You know, they, they got, their kids are disciples. Their kids are disciples. Let me tell you something. You, you, you got to be a great mom to get Janelle to become a disciple. I'm telling you, man. Janelle to become a, man, Mama George you know, she's done a great job right there with Janelle right there, guys. Uh, I, lo I love comfort. You know, comfort today, you know, uh, I came in today. I was like, okay, God, you know, uh, just give me some encouragement right there. Mama Comfort, she's like, hey, I got, I got something for you. I'm like, what, what do you have for me? She gives me a little bag, right? The bag was super heavy. I'm like, what did you get? She brought me some food, guys. I'm like, oh. Man, just trying to lose some weight, get ready for the wedding right there, Mom. It's like, you know? But of course, uh, it's great to have you guys over here today. Uh, and, uh, you know, in case you guys don't know what day it is today, for those who are, you know, oblivious to what's going on, it's Mothering Sunday, okay? Yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, I look back into... What Mother and Sunday really is, it's roots and where she came from, right? And you're very surprised, it's got Christian roots. I was, I was like, wow, really? Now, of course, when they begin, during the 16th century, what would happen is that, you know, uh, they had a custom where on the fourth week, the last week, all right, of March, uh, at the end of Lent season, okay, we don't celebrate Lent, amen? I'm just sharing, you know, facts right there. Uh, at the end of Lent season, what would happen is on the last Sunday, people would go back to what is called their mother church. And their mother church was usually the church that they grew up in, the church that got baptized in, or the local cathedral or local congregation. So what would happen is that people would be traveling and stuff like that, and they'll go back home, and on this last Sunday, they'll go back to their mother church. And I, I think about how, you know, we go down to our mother church, London right there, for congregational service, and today, our mother church gave birth to the Warsaw International Christian Church today. And what would happen is that individuals who would go back home to their mothering church, they would, call, they would be called mothering, basically. That's what it was called. And then after a while, what happened was that this day became a time where, you know, uh, you know slaves, you know, uh, servants and workers, they gave them that day off. They said, okay, you got this day off. So that way you can go to church, take your family with you, because that's what church is. You're going to bring your whole family right there. That's why Common's family is here all the way from Bath, guys. And then by the 1920s, this, this custom of Mothering Sunday is spread all the way around Europe right there. So, man, Mothering Sunday, guys, has strong roots within God and Christianity right there. Let's go to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. You know, firstly, you know, Everyone has done a phenomenal job so far. You know, uh, it's great to have Ebenezer back right there, guys. Ebenezer. Yeah. Yeah. Ebenezer found us online. He was like, I'm sick of my life. I'm going to come to church, stay the Bible in one week and got baptized. Yeah. One week. And we thought, okay, he was the record right there, right? But Johnny Chan came around and he beat his record. He got baptized in one week as well right there, guys. And, uh, you know, what can I say about my best friend, you know, uh, uh, where, where, where is he at right there? Samuel Ajay, you know, uh, he did a great job with the contribution speech, guys, okay? That was awesome. His 12th birthday, the number of completion. Uh, let's, let's, let's get into it. Isaiah 49, you guys with me, right? Isaiah 49? 
it says something over here. The title lesson simply the characteristics of a mother. You know, why does Mother and Sunday have strong roots within God and Christianity? Isaiah 49, say amen when you guys are there. Amen. Okay, cool. It's in the Old Testament, by the way. All right, Isaiah 49. In verse 13, it says this. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. I hope you guys are joyful today. It says, burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. It doesn't feel like that sometimes. I feel like, man, God has forgotten me, man. I feel like God has forsaken me. I felt that sometimes, guys. But here's some encouragement for me. This is what God says. He says in verse 15, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? He's like, you know, it's like, would a mother forget the baby she's breastfeeding? Like, she's just forget, I have no baby. No, she wouldn't. God says, though she may forget, I will not forget you. And the church says, Amen. you know, the reason why Mothering Sunday has strong roots within God and Christianity is because God has motherly qualities. Yes. God made mothers. Yes. <laughs> so he's got motherly qualities. Yes. And it says over here that although, of course, it's like almost near impossible for a mom to forget the nursing child, and he's like, okay, maybe, let's say she forgets. I don't know. Maybe she's stressed up with the bills right there. I don't know. And she somehow forgets she's got a baby to feed. God's like, okay, she may forget, but I will not forget you. That's what God says. I will not forget you. He said, how, how, how does he remember you? Verse 16. See, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. You know, this says that God has engrave the name, your name on the palm of his hand. Come on. Right now. Come on. He's got Sophie right there. Come on. He's got Olu right there. Come on. He's got Claire right there. He's got Tundurai right there. He's got Luke on his hand. He's got Samuel on his hand. He's got Christine on his hand. He's got Marcus on his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. And it says that he's got everyone's name on his hand. And this was caused, was, uh, this foreshadowed Christ. This chapter foreshadows Christ. And this was fulfilled on the nail-driven Jesus Christ on the cross. Where he went to Thomas and said, you're doubting? Look at my hands. Look at my hands. Observe my hands, Thomas. I died for you. I died for you. And every day as God sits, as Jesus sits up there in heaven, he looks at his nail-driven hands, he remembers your name. He remembers that I came down on earth to die for you. I want to inspire you today that God died for you through Jesus Christ, his son, on the cross today. Now, some famous quotes about mothers. One man said this, life doesn't come with the manual, it comes with the mother. I like that one. It says, a man loves his sweetheart the most, his wife the best, but his mother the longest. Aww. That's really true. This one says, nothing is really lost until your mom can't find it. <laughs> That's true. I don't know, they know where everything is at, man. You look the whole hour trying to find the remote, your mom knows exactly where it is. Another one says, whoever wrote the song, Easy Like Sunday Morning, do not have kids. <laughs> I'm like, I like that. You know, there's some quotes, of course, about mothers to appreciate just what they've done. You know, they show the difference between a mother and a father. You know, they say, okay, there's some differences between a mom and a dad, right? You know, they say, uh, here's some differences between a mother and a father. The son says, hey, I'm going out. The mom's response is, put your head on. Take out the trash. Don't forget to drop by your aunt. Buy some bread on your way back. And don't be out too late. The son goes to the dad, I'm going out. Okay. <laughs> That's the dad. They say the difference between the missed phone calls between your mom and your dad. It said, Mom, 48, Dad, 1. <laughs> That's true. At a parents' meeting, the mom says, 
I will take the day off. We need to see his math teacher. In fact, we need to see all his teachers. When is graduation album going to be ready? The dad's like, what grade are you in again? I don't even know what grade you're in. You know, that, that's the difference between a mom and a dad. Now, let me tell you, guys, dads are awesome, guys, okay? Dads are amazing, but of course, moms are awesome as well, amen? amen. Now, mothers are found throughout the whole entire Bible, guys, okay? They are found throughout the Bible. In the beginning, you've got Eve. She's known as the mother of all living. You know, Eve was great. I know despite the fact that, you know, she listened to Satan right there. Don't listen to Satan, sisters, okay? She had, she actually had no example of how to be a mom. You know, we look down on Eve. She had no example at all. She's like, man, I'm figuring out how to be a mom, right? She's the mother of all living. Then you have Sarah. She's known as the promised mother because she had the promised child. You got Leah, the forgotten mother. Because, you know, of course, uh, 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 Jacob loved Rachel over Leah. She was overlooked. You got Jochebed. Jochebed is Moses' mother. She's called the sacrificial mother. She had Moses, and she said, man, I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to put him into the waters of baptism, because the name Moses means to be drawn out of the waters. And she sacrificed Moses, and of course, later on, he became the leader. Naomi, she's known as a spiritual mother. That's why she's a spiritual mom. Hannah, the unloved mother. The unloved mother. You got Elizabeth, the impossible mother. We're going to look at her today. And then you got Mary, the mother of our Savior right there, Jesus Christ. See, from the garden all the way to the cross, moms have been present all the way throughout the Bible. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. You guys with me today? 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy right there. And of course, you know, all the T's are together. Paul wrote 1 Timothy, then Titus, then 2 Timothy. Got to get the hydration. It says over here, <laughs> amen, fired up right there. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 1, pick it in verse 2 actually, it says to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ, Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recording your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Louis, and your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. And the church says, Amen. Your grandmother can give you cookies or conviction. Amen. That's what they can give you. You know, grandmothers, you go to grandma's house, man, she feeds you, man. Bye. You live full. Bye. But here, we got the grandmother. It says, uh, your grandmother, Lewis. And she could have given Timothy a bunch of cookies, make him feel good, a whole bunch of sugar. But she said, no, no, I'm going to give you some convictions, Timothy. I'm going to instill some convictions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach the word of God to you, Timothy. Now, we know, of course, that uh, his mother, Lewis, right, you need, sorry, she was married to a Greek father, right, a Greek man. So he, he, the, the spiritual side of Timothy came from the women, right? Because the father was a Greek, right? The, he, he, he wasn't a Jew. He didn't know about God and so forth. But then his spirituality came from the, the woman, the, the grandmother, the mother, and then down to Timothy. I, I like this because it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says you've got to impress the law on your children. Yeah. If you're a mom today... You, you, you got to force the word of God onto your kids. Force them. I'm being dead serious. you got to force them. The NLT of the scripture says that you got to repeat again and again and again and again the word of God to your kids. I was forced to go to church. Forced. Dragged. So you're gonna go, they woke me up early in the morning. I'm like trying to have a good time right there, five years old. They woke me up early in the morning on a Sunday. Get ready, mom. You know, put me, got me ready. Put best thing on my face. Face was glistening. <laughs> Put my clothes on. Just, let's go. I'm like, where are we going? I was like, man, church. I'm like, dang it. And uh, it, it was challenging, man. And honestly, I wouldn't be here. I would not be here. I'm being dead serious. I would not be here preaching the word of God to you if God wasn't drilled inside of me as a kid. If you, as a mom, you gotta, you got to impress the word of God into your children. Why? Because Satan will raise up your kids. 
Satan will raise up your kids. I'm telling you, Satan will raise up your kids. Right? You've got to impress the word of God onto them or Satan's going to raise your kids. Question, mothers, who's raising your children right now? And then the government raise your kids? The government who tells that there's no genders? Is that who you're letting you raise your kids? The government that tells that, hey, it's okay to have sex before marriage? Is that who you're letting raise your kids? Right? No. You've you got to impress the word of God into your kids. you got to impress. You, tell the kids to become a disciple right there. Now, of course, you know, it says over here, in verse 5, he says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, right? Faith that is sincere. The, the, the Greek word for sincere over here is a very long word which I can't pronounce today. It means, I'll learn about it sometimes on the line. It means without hypocrisy. It says, you've got a faith that is without hypocrisy. It's not phony. You know phony faith? So you don't, you, you, it's like, Timothy, you don't have what is called phony faith. Let me tell you, I was a phony Christian for a long time. Phony Christian, right? I, I, when I, this, this is me going to church, guys. I, this is how I got to confess here. Me going to church, I never used to, I used to only, I used to time church service, okay? I used to go to church only when the preacher was preaching the sermon. That's what I, I would do. Okay, and uh, I'd, every single time, religiously, I'd go, and I knew the time the preacher was preaching. I was like, okay, it's preaching at about 10.30, okay, I, I mean, let me make a way. And I did this for years running. Service is over, I'm out. That was me. Okay, one day, I accidentally woke up early, and I got there early, right? I was like, dang it, man, I was ticked off. I was like, where are you the church service? Man, I was so angry. And uh, I, I saw different parts of services I never saw before. The welcome, I'm like, what's going on? The contribute, I'm like, what's going on over here, right? So I was, I, I was taking the far back, right? Now, Something that the, the, the preacher would do every single Sunday. He'll say, if you want to give your life to Christ, come to the front. Right? Now, I was guilt-ridden every single Sunday. Why? Because on, on Sunday night, I came home around 3 a.m. From a, from a party. Right? I was watching porn. I was muscle being the night before. So I came to church. I was like freaked out. On my, I was like, okay, I, I need Jesus. And every single Sunday, he was like, okay, who wants to give their life to Christ? And I was too prideful to go to the front. So he knew that. And he said, okay, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you're too afraid, you, you know, you, you're embarrassed, don't worry. Just stay where you are. I was like, okay, amen. Thank you. Awesome. And he said this prayer. And as he said the prayer, he's like, you know what? Can you raise your hand? I'm like, come on, preacher. No, you're pushing it too far, man. Right? <laughs> now, I, I'm standing there. I'm there. I'm sitting down. And now I got to raise my hands, right? And I look around. I'm like, looking around. Who's looking at me? Because I was too embarrassed. I was paranoid right there, insecure because of my sin. And I just lift up my hands. Every Sunday, and I'll say the Lord's Prayer every single Sunday. And I did this for years running, years running. Why? I was a phony Christian. I was a phony Christian. I want you to know today that if you say you believe in Jesus and you're living a life of sexual immorality, impurity, masturbation, and pornography, you're, you're racist, you're racism, right? You don't love people. Right? You're living in a, relation, you're in a relationship with someone who, you know, uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're living with someone who you're dating and you're not married yet. Right? I want to let you know today you're not a Christian. You're not saved. You're not. You're not. You're not a Christian. You don't have what is called sincere faith. You see, Paul here says they had sincere faith. Right? It wasn't a, a phony kind of faith right there. We live in a time where individuals, you know, it, it, sometimes you have what is called family faith. Family faith. Right? No. It says, Paul says over here, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother and in your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you. Faith that's alive and not dead. And he says, you've got your own individual faith, Timothy. We live in a time where people have family faith. I'm a Christian because, hey, you know, I was born in a Christian family. Where's that in the scripture? I'm a, I'm a Christian because my nan is a Christian. Bro, stop listening to your nan. Be a man. Have your own convictions right there. Stop listening to your nan. You gotta have your own faith. Question is, is your faith sincere today? Is your faith sincere today? Do you have dead faith? You know what's dead faith? Cotton candy Christianity. That's dead faith. Cotton candy Christianity. You guys know cotton candy, right? Yeah, yeah okay, the Americans, yeah. So the, the Brits, it's called candy floss in Britain, I'm told, right? Yeah, candy floss, okay, for the Brits. Um, 
candy floss. You know, you know how it is, right? Cotton candy. You know, I, I love cotton. It was awesome. It was beautiful, right? And uh, of course, I used to, you know, it, sometimes it comes in a bag or on a stick, okay? One of the two, all right? I used to get on the stick. And uh, you, 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 the first time I saw it, I was blown. I was like, this is amazing. And uh, of course, the machine is you know, rotating everything. The guy's like, vroom, vroom, and, it's, vroom, and it, it, it pops up. You're like, oh, this is awesome. Oh, oh, this is, I'm like six years old. I'm like, this is amazing. Like, oh. and, then, and, then, and then he gives it to me. And I was like, ooh. I, I take it, put it in my mouth. And it lasts for like five seconds. I'm like, OK, let me get another one. Let me just melt again. Melt again. And before you know you eat the whole thing, you got this little stick or an empty bag. And that's dead faith has no substance. Wow. It's sugary, sweet, it's nice, it's awesome, it's beautiful. Gone. No substance. See, faith has substance. Why? Hebrews 11 says, faith is a substance of things hoped for and things you've not seen. That's real faith. That's real faith. Cotton candy Christianity. You know, over here, we see that mothers are awesome. They're amazing. They gave birth to what is called a leader. And his name is Timothy over here. Timothy. Timothy was a leader. And, uh, you know, of course, today we're going to look at some two amazing mothers right there. Okay, let's go to uh, Luke chapter 1. You guys with me, right? Yeah. Luke chapter 1. Tell the lesson simply the characteristics of a mother. Now, Luke was a doctor. It's awesome. We got Luke over here from University of Birmingham. Yeah. And... Luke, of course, he's one of the only individuals who records two births, okay? Out of all the Gospels, he's the only one who records two of these births, okay? Matthew records one, the one of Jesus, and that's it, but Luke is the only one. He's a doctor. So he was like, okay, I, 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 I like births, okay? I'm a doctor. He's like, he's fine about, you know, the human being right there. He's fine about things being human, okay? So he's the only one who records uh, 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 this thing over here. Now, what I love is that it is in Luke, right, the first few verses, verses 1 to about 4, he writes in what is called classical academic Greek. Okay, he's like, okay, it's okay, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a scholar, okay, I, I've graduated, I got a degree, and he writes in classical Greek, you know, you know, he, you know how it's like when you write in a scholar uh, language right there, okay, use words you never use, you know, therefore, henceforth, you know, uh, thou, and, 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 you know, moreover, you know, uh, you know, it seems to be a complication uh, into these existences, and so, you know, use all these words, right, he's trying to sound posh, okay, and, and he does that in the first few verses, right, but verses 5 all the way throughout, he talks the common language. Why? Because you can't intellectualize God's miracles. Yeah. He's like, no, 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 no. My degree can't understand the miracles of God right now. I, I'm going I'm to I'm write, write the way it should be written. He doesn't go all academic all the way from verses 5 all the way down. Now, of course, I, I got a question for you guys today, seeing that it's Mother's Day. And, uh, you know, uh, Joseph Perigio, because he didn't, he, he, he didn't get the opportunity to speak today, he, he's like, bro, can you just ask the church this few questions right there? I'm like, amen, man. And I said, bro, what are the questions, bro? Said, okay, he's like, what was Cleopatra's favorite day of the year? <laughs> Mommy's day. Mommy's day. <laughs> Mommy's day. Okay, to me, there you go. So there you go. There you go. You got away. Okay. Now, Kane, TikTok guy, you know, um, you know how he is. He likes all the different languages and stuff like that. You know, he went to TikTok festival yesterday. He's all popular. Everyone knows him. He's got like a million thousand views and stuff like that. Amen. It's like, bro, can you ask the church a few questions? So I'm like, amen, bro. He says, what do you call a small mom? Minimum. 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 That's Kane Taylor right there. TikTok magician. Now, Lavar's been fruitful, and he's, he's getting confident right now. He's got a, a bit of confidence right there. He's like, okay, Frank, I know I'm not going to preach a sermon yet. Someday I'll preach a sermon. Can you ask the church a few questions? I'm like, amen, bro. He says, what do you call, <laughs> what do you call a mom who can't draw? Tracy. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's Lamont right there, guys, okay? These are your brothers in Christ. These are your brothers in Christ. These are not my questions, guys. Talk to these guys after church service. In Luke chapter 1. The first point is simply God's grace takes away your disgrace. 
God's grace takes away your disgrace. In Luke 1 and verse 5, it says this. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. You know, of course, it gives an introduction over here of this amazing couple. Uh, you know, it says they were righteous, they were blameless, year after year, they were just so close to God, they were doing all the right things. But it, it mentions uh, uh, something over here, a negative. It says that they were not able to conceive. And it gives you a fact. Now, again, Luke's a doctor. He's like, they're old, <laughs> okay? And if Luke is a doctor telling you you're old, he probably means the medical term, like, you're old, dude, okay? You cannot have kids. That's it, bro, all right? Uh, and he, he puts this over there for a reason. Now, you ask how old were they? About 60 to 70 years of age at this time, okay? 60 to 70 years of age, okay? They were that old, okay? Now, verse 8 says this. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as priest before God. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. <laughs> all right? Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. You know what the name John means? God is graceful. God is graceful. And it says over here, he'll be a joy and delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. For, he was, for he'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or the fermented drink. And uh, he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. Man, that's a cranking baby. Wow. That, is, that is the most spiritual baby to walk the face of the earth at this time. Before he, I, 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 man, I don't know about you guys. I like using my imagination sometimes, you know. And <laughs> he had the Holy Spirit before he was born. He probably had like a smooth breath. It just came out. <laughs> just came out. Like, this baby's not crying. <laughs> Damn, bro, it's like that. It's like, he's already talking, you know, he's got the gifts of the Holy Spirit right there. He's like talking in tongues, walking around. Mom's trying to feed him. Hey, John, tell me, come and eat. No, I'm fasting. You know, right? <laughs> Damn, bro. Damn, John. Fasting baby, man. Spiritual baby. Damn. Fasting baby. I'm like, damn, this baby doesn't cry, talks to you, talks back at you. I don't like this, right? And, and, but I think, you know, God did this for them because it was, it was going to be easier, right? I, I believe he allowed this because, you know, they were old, man. <laughs> like, so it's kind of hard and challenging. So he, he, he allowed uh, John the Baptist of the Holy Spirit at a young age to make him, you know, to raise John up in a very easier way than normal, right? Uh, so God, in a way, raised John the Baptist, basically. God raised John the Baptist. Okay, it says, verse 17, uh, verse 18, 16, rather, who will bring back many of the peoples of Israel to the Lord their God, and who will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children. He's like, at this time, there were moms who didn't like their kids. Though mom was like, I don't like my kid anymore, man. Though were dads who didn't want to be dads anymore. And John the Baptist was coming to turn the hearts of the parents to their children, to be parents again. And he says, and the disobedience of the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready people prepared for the Lord. Right? Now, of course, over here, it, you, you, the name Zechariah means God remembers. That's what his name is. Zechariah means God remembers. Right? And now, over here, you're going to stand something. From the time when... John, you know, uh, sorry, Zechariah was priest to a time where here he's chosen. The priesthood had increased. There were a lot of priests at this time. Some say that there was about uh, roughly about uh, 18,000 to 20,000 priests at this time already. Now, he gets selected. He gets chosen. And you only get this opportunity once in your lifetime. So from the time he became priest, from the priest to the beginning, all the way till now, he's never been chosen. He's seen so many people go in and out, get chosen. And that's how it is sometimes. You know, we sit here like, man, when am I going to get sent out? Man, when am I going to get sent out? Man, when, when's my prayer going to get answered? Man, when's this going to happen? You see what I mean? That's how he was. And he saw everyone go in and out of the temple, in and out of the temple, in and out of the temple. Right? Don't get distracted, guys. Amen? And 
he gets chosen. He says he got, he got chosen to go in to burn incense. Now, every time you went into a temple to burn incense, it means you're offering a prayer. You're offering a prayer. Zechariah, although his name is God remembers, he forgot his own prayer. He forgot his own prayer. Now, of course, the age of, you know, you being able to conceive, you know, Mary and, you know, not Mary, sorry, Elizabeth and uh, um, Zechariah over here, they say it's about roughly 45 or so, close to 50. Now, they were 60, 70 years of age. So they, they gave up on the prayer like 10 years ago. They're like, man, I'm done with that prayer, man. I forgot about it. But just because God, you've forgotten doesn't mean God has forgotten. See that? See, the only thing that God forgets is your sin. That's the only thing God chooses to forget, your sin. Right? And Satan wants to remind you of your past sometimes. We let Satan remind us of a past that God has really forgotten. Exactly. Why are you, why are you allowed Satan to do that? Like, man. God's like, no, I don't remember what you did. Right? And he forgot, you know, Kudos' uh, sins right there. He got baptized last week, guys. Amen. He forgot his sins. So the only thing God forgets is your sin when you get baptized as a true Christian. But everything else he remembers. <laughs> And here he remembered the prayer of Zechariah. You know, Zechariah was routinely coming into the temple, routinely praying every single day, but he wasn't waiting for God to finally answer his prayer. See, you could be routinely reading your Bible, routinely coming to church, routinely walking, you know, having your prayer walks and stuff like that, but you're not waiting for God to answer your prayer. And guess what happens when that happens right there? Actually, let's go to Malachi. Malachi, Malachi chapter 6. Malachi. Malachi. It's got a Malachi right there. Malachi 4, rather. Malachi 4, it says this in verse 5. It says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. It says, He will turn the hearts of the parents to the children, and the hearts of the children to the parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Malachi was, uh, was the last prophet. God sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. King after king after king. Priest after priest after priest. And the people wouldn't listen. And he said, you know what? I'm tired of talking. He's like, okay, you don't want to listen anymore? I'm tired of talking. So Malachi was the last, he, uh, last uh, preacher right there, last prophet. And from Malachi to Luke, 400 years of silence. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the silent treatment. Right? We give each other silent treatment for like a week or, or a week, a month, a, a year. No, God, 400 years. I ain't saying a single thing for 400 years. And all you got to do is rely on the last word of God. And now, God comes to Zechariah and Elizabeth. He wants to end the silence. He wants to, he's answering their prayer. So there's a big deal, guys. Let's go back to Luke chapter 1. There's a big deal. Let's see how he, how, how he responds to this. Verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? Oh, my goodness. Bro, okay. Okay, bro. Um, you just got chosen to go into the temple. You just saw an angel, which you've never seen in your whole entire life. And then you got the death to us. How is this going to happen? You know, some of you guys, you, you forget you've been chosen. Out of all the two million people in Birmingham, God has chosen you. Yeah. And, and he forgot that. So like, I'm chosen. God has finally answered my prayer. And he says, how can we show of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you'll be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you don't believe my word, which will come true at the appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, but he kept making signs to them, but he remained unable to speak. When his time of service had completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. The question is, are you ready for that church service where God will send you his angel to finally answer your prayer? Are you ready for it? Are you ready for that church service? Are you ready for that encounter with God 
where God finally answers your prayers. We see over here that Zechariah was actually faithless. And we see that his faithlessness produced silence. You can be very certain, when there's silence, there's faithlessness involved. When nothing's going on, there's an issue of faith. That's the issue. And, and, and Zechariah was like, okay, how? how? You have no faith, therefore I'm gonna, you're going to be silent. You're not going to say a single thing. I can imagine this. This was challenging. Until you finally believe that the, what, what I've said is going to come true. A lack of faith. One man said, evil reigns when good men do nothing. Yeah. Evil reigns when good men say nothing. This was good news. And because of his faithlessness, guess what? He couldn't even share it. Wow. He, couldn't share his, he couldn't share his faith. Wow. He couldn't share the good things that happened. He had to keep it to himself. You know, faithlessness is, is the reason why we don't, we don't, we don't evangelize. Faithlessness is the reason why we're, we're not, not going to invite women to Women's Day. Faithlessness is the reason why it's silent in your life right now. Faithlessness. And I'm like, wow. Now, some of you guys will be fired up. Man, I got to say anything? Ooh, man. I could be quiet for nine months. Mm. Don't share my faith for nine months. Mm. Don't even my to church for nine months. Mm. This is awesome. Some of you guys may be like that. Question, who are you trying to save? Who are you trying to save, guys? You know, I want to lift up Bernard. I want to lift up Bernard. I want to lift up Bernard. Bernard's got three guests today. All three are studying the Bible. He, he's not silent. He's got faith right there. He's not silent. He's got faith. He's going after it. Now, of course, in verse 25, it says over here, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. You know, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there were about five women who were barren. You know, and in the Bible, when you were barren, it, it, it was a very shameful thing. It was disgraceful. People were like, dang, you can't have kids. There was a stigma attached to you. you, you, you were, you, uh, the word disgrace literally means, um, disgrace means a loss of reputation or respect or an embarrassment. That's what happens. It's like there's something in your life that causes you to lose reputation among people, lose respect of people, and it's an embarrassment. And that's what it was over here. And throughout the Bible, all the women in the, in the Bible who were barren, they were stigmatized. And a lot of times they knew it was from God. They were like, man, they felt cursed. They were like, man, God, please help me. Right? Who are some of these women? Hannah was one of them. She cried. Sarah was one of them. She begged God, please open up my womb. Right? There was a stigma attached to it. You know, when I think about this, I think about how sometimes there can be stigmas that mothers can face. There are stigmas mothers can face. How about the stigma of divorce? You now, you can face that as a mother, the stigma of divorce. How about the stigma of being a single mom? Right? You know, any single moms over here? Mama G, man. She's doing Mama, Mama Betty, all the single moms. They're doing it. I was raised by a single mom. They're doing it. Single mom. How about the stigma of an unplanned pregnancy? Right? Wow, we just don't plan it. Why well, I think it's a teen, it's a young individual. You know, in my family, uh, an unplanned pregnancy brings like a whole lot of stigma on you. There was a time where, you know, my sister was like ill, like crazy. She was super, super sick. And uh, everyone was wondering, she was about, at that time, she was about 19, 20 at that time. And uh, she just finished school. And it, she, she was like ill. Now, in a, in a black home, you don't, go, you, don't, you don't go to a family until like you're like near death, like you're like 99%. You don't go to a hospital until you're close to death, okay? Until they see you like convulsing on the floor, foaming at the mouth, then they'll take you to a hospital. Other than that, there's VIX. VIX, VIX, VIX is everything. I broke my, I broke my, I broke my pinky, VIX. That's it. Sleep. Sleep. That's what it's sleep. It's like, go sleep. And I'm like, dang it, man. I'm sick, mom. I can't sleep. Like, it's hurting. So that's how it was. So if you don't have medical aid, it's pretty challenging, right? So my sister was sick for like weeks, like about two weeks and stuff, right? She was in bed. Everyone was like, what's going on? We tried to help her out. Nothing was going on. And then it got, it got to a point where it was really bad. She was having like these crazy cramps, right? It was really, really bad. So they took her to the hospital, right? Took her to the hospital. And uh, we're trying, we have no idea what's going on, right? Doctor comes out. Congratulations! <laughs> my mom is like, for what? Now she's ticked off. She's like ticked off, like what in the world's going for? What, what are you I gotta pay money for this, you know, hospital and stuff like that. You're gonna be a grandmother. 
and my mom fainted. <laughs> I was like, she literally fainted. I'm serious. And I was an uncle that night. I was like, okay, I'm uncle. Uncle, I gotta go to school. I'm like Michael Bucasa's age. I'm an uncle already. <laughs> What's the point? It was something we did not expect. You know, today that's what is called, I believe, you know, uh, Samuel shared about, I shared about earlier as well in my lesson, an unplanned church planting. Yeah. That wasn't planned. See, some, it, it, we, we like living our lives according to plans. It's, it's got to work. Yeah. Five o'clock, this, this, that, you know, one o'clock, yeah, church now, okay, 12 o'clock, boom, I go. No, 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 no. Sometimes you, you can have certain plans, but then, and of course, you know, God, he can complicate things in your life. See, no one expected me, you know, no one expected, yeah, I didn't expect to go to the Netherlands. <laughs> that was not my plan at all. I thought, hey, Janae will come here, awesome, we crank, you know, Birmingham right there. And I'm like, Frank, no, you're going there. I'm like, dang, <laughs> okay. Unplanned. Things you don't expect at all. You know, how would you handle things you don't expect happening in your life right now? How would you handle it? You see what I mean? Some of you guys are planning to come to church today, and that's it. Like, hey, that's my last church service. No, no, no. God has got plans for you. He's going to change it right there. Now let's go to verse 26 over here. Let's go to the second one quickly. I know some of you guys are like wondering, man, where's this guy going to end? Okay. <laughs> verse 26. Okay, my second point is simply the Great Commission comes from a mother of submission. Wow. The Great Commission comes from a mother of submission. It says over here in verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin place to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. You know, she's like, Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. You know, it's like, it's like a little buttering up right there. So, like, oh, you know, you know so, so it's like doing that. You know, hey, bro, you know, your sermon was amazing. You know, you know, you're an amazing leader, bro. Sis, what do you want? Just tell me what you want. Okay, stop buttering me up. Just tell me what you want. Okay. And she was troubled at this greeting. You know, some of you guys may be troubled by the greeting you got today. You know, wondering why people are hugging me, what you guys want. Okay, we want you to be saved. You get, get baptized. Right? It says in verse uh, 30, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He'll be great, and be called the son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Wow. I'm like, this is great. Okay, this is, this is awesome, right? You got this angel, Gabriel. Okay, of course, Gabriel went over to Zechariah. Zechariah had no faith, got silence, right? Uh, now, it's, okay, let me go to a 14-year-old. A 14-year-old. Okay? It's okay, this 60 year old guy has no faith. Let me go to a 14 year old. Okay? Mary, she was an, it is said as well, she was an orphan. It is said she was an orphan. She was 14 years of age. She was an orphan. She was an ordinary girl from an ordinary city. Right? And look at her response. Verse 34 How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. You know, you see the difference between faith and faithlessness? Zechariah had no faith. He's like, how can I be sure of this, bro? It, She's like, okay, how will this be? <laughs> right? Since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Amen. Our translations say, for with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. Verse 38, I'm the Lord's skeptic, right? She's like, I'm the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. See the, the contrast? You know, it's like, why, why would God use a 14-year-old to put this amount of pressure on you? Right? I, any 14-year-olds over here? Okay, okay, Demi's 14 right there. Okay. And, yeah, 14 years of age. You got an angel coming to you and say, you're going to deliver the, the son of God. No pressure. Easy peasy, right? Normal. Yeah, you've had babies before, right, Mary? Yeah, you know how to raise a kid, right? Yeah, awesome. Why? You know, teens, they say that in the frontal lobe of your brain, right, it, it, it's, it develops the fastest and the strongest between the age of 14 and 19 and 20. So in between that time period, you can actually, in a way, uh, handle a lot of pressure. 
So God knew, like, oh, you can handle this pressure. It's easy. Teens, campus, you can handle the pressure. You can become a true Christian at a campus age. Submission. We can put it close, guys. Hang in there. Don't worry. The word submission in the Hebrew, I love it. It means to be void of fat and to become lean. That's, that's what, what submission means. So submission makes you shredded and lean and fit. That's what it does. That's what Hebrew. So the Hebrew, they understood, man. If I'm submitted, man, I'm void of fat. Because that means if you don't, that means if you don't submit to God's plan, that's what you, you, get, you gain weight. You gain weight. That's what happens. Why? Because you're not going anywhere. God's going to send you places. And I know nope, I'm not submitting. Wow. Stay right here. And you stay in the same place. You don't go anywhere. You don't exercise. You don't nothing. You gain weight. That's what happens because you're not submissive. You're not submissive. You know? <laughs> you're living life like this. I want you to know that life is like a bowl of water. Right now, everyone's got a bottle of water. And you got water inside of it. As you guys can tell, I've only had about two sips during this lesson. Why? I'm trying to keep my water. <laughs> I'm trying to make it run up. And every single person in life has a bottle of water. And you, because you know it's going to run out, guess what you do? Just take a sip. Should I take a sip? Right? Take a little sip. Over here. A little sip. Over there. Because if you drink it all, it's over. You got nothing. Life with God is a full bottle of water. Consistently full. And you know how it's like when you're a full bottle of water, man. You're just drinking, man. You don't worry. Because it's always consistently running. Yeah. What's fueling you today? Jesus. What's fueling you today? What's your source of joy? What's your source of comfort? Are you living life anxious because your water's about to run out? Is that what you, you know, it's, that's life without God. That's a life with, without submission. And we see over here that she lived, she lived life to the full. She lived, you know, living life to the full means you experience everything in life. It's not just the, the awesome, great things. No, it's everything. We experience hardship, yeah. growth, yeah. death, yeah. you know, marriage, yeah. problems in marriage, yeah. everything. Because yeah. God wants your life to be exciting. Yeah. So you wake up the next day, okay, what's the next hardship right there? Okay, uh, I overcame singlehood. Okay, what's the next one right there? It's fun, it's exciting. Right? Without God, it's the same thing. Monotonous. So, same over and over. Rep repetitive. Yeah. Repetitive. Yeah. Repetitive. God, I'm going to spice up your life. Yes. I'm going to give you a hardship to spice up your life. Yes. Make your life to the full. And maybe live life to the full. She was submissive. And what it did was it brought about Christ, Jesus Christ, who gave us the great commission today. To make disciples of all nations. In closing, do you have genuine faith? Do you have genuine faith today? Do you have sincere faith where it's not phony, it's not family faith, it's not attached to anyone? Do you have your own personal faith? If you don't, I encourage you to get into a Bible study with us. Study Bible with us. Get, get to know how to have a personal relationship with God. Question, guys. Let's be submissive. Let's move. Let's not gain weight. Let's not gain spiritual weight, guys. Let's move. Let God move you. Let him move you this week to get someone to come out to uh, Women's Day on Saturday. Sisters, I encourage you. Register. All of you guys. All sisters gotta get registered. Let's go out this week. We're gonna blow it out. Let's get a guest to come out to church this coming Sunday, guys. Let's, let's fill the walls of baptism. Let's, let's, let's get people saved. Yeah. Be fruitful. Yeah. I wanna end with a poem called My Mother. It says, Who sat and watched my infant head when sleeping on my cradle bed and tears of sweet affection shed? My mother. When pain and sickness made me cry, who gazed upon heavy eye? and wept for fear that I should die. My mother, who taught my infant lips to pray and love God's holy book and day and walk in wisdom's pleasant way. My mother, and can I ever cease to be 
affectionate and kind to thee. Who was so very kind to me, my mother? Oh no, the thought I cannot bear. And if God please my life to spare, I hope I shall reward thy care, my mother. When thou art feeble, old and gray, my healthy arms shall be thy stay, and I'll soothe thy pains away, my mother. I love you guys, and to God be all the glory. <laughs>